Amen. Good morning. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Well, listen, man, I tell you what, I just got to say, wasn't God's presence awesome while ago while we were worshiping? So good. Well, listen, my name is Chris, and my wife and I are the student ministry pastors here at the church. And uh, our pastors, uh, Pastor Kirk and Pastor Suzette, are suffering at the beach. So we're going to really bless them in just a moment and pray for them. No, every, every, come on, everybody needs a vacation sometime. Hello. Somebody's like, yes, I'm counting down the days. So uh, we're, we're very thankful for our pastors, and we are going to bless them in just a second. And we're glad that they can get away and get a break and get recharged and get refreshed and take in some waves and get some sun. I, 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 I want to go. I'm ready to go. So anyway, uh, you know, so we're, we're just so excited uh, for what God's doing in this month of Servolution. Somebody say Servolution. And we, we have some really cool things going on. And, and as you just heard from the videos, and by the way, that plate full of fried chicken looks so good on that rescue mission deal. Uh, so somebody's got, somebody's from Alabama in the back kitchen, I can tell you that right now. Uh, but, but I do, I do want to say this, we have been talking with our young people, and I just want to take a moment this before we dive into the Word, uh, about for this summer really diving into the Word of God like never before. Uh, come on, God did not call us just to be believers, He called us to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. It's important that you believe, but then you take your belief to a whole nother level and be a disciple. And so we're believing and praying and for not just for young people, but for us as a house to be disciples, to be devoted followers in love with Jesus Christ. Amen? And so uh, ministering to young people for many years now, uh, you know, one thing we have seen big time is a decline in Bible reading. Uh, we, have, we serve the largest generation ever recorded in history that we know, the largest generation ever. They're also the most medicated generation ever. They're also the most biblical illiterate generation ever. And so there's some issues there. I could brag on them forever. I could brag on this young generation forever, and, and we're called to do it. But there's some issues there. So we're challenging our young people. How many young people I got in the room this morning? All right, we're challenging our young people to bring their Bible with them. How many people have your Bible? Everybody in there, how many people have your Bible with you electronically, all right, on your pad, on your phone. How many people have some kind of a leather-bound book with some form of print? And it even has a little red in the, toward the end there. Anybody have that thing? It, you could knock your kid over the, you know, just knock them out with it, you know, or drive your foot, break a toe, you know. But how many people all together, how many people have their Bibles with them some way, electronic their Bibles? All right, look at this. There you go. Come on. Somebody's like, no, I got my Bible right here in my heart. That word, if I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against sin. That, yes, it is. You want to hide it there, but you also need to read it every day. Come on. The B-I-B-L-E, because that's the book for me. Amen. Awesome. Awesome. So we want to we dive. If you have your Bible with you, turn to the book of Mark, to the book of Mark, chapter 10. We're going to go there in just a few moments. Young people, I'm so proud of you. Bring in your Bible. You better bring it back. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Mark chapter 10, we're going to go there in just a few moments. I want to open in prayer, and we're going to dive right into it this morning. Holy Spirit, we just thank you that you are so welcome here in this place. We do. We, we thank you that in your presence, Lord, there is freedom, there is peace, there is joy, there is strength. I could go on and on bragging on the things that we can find in you. And I thank you, Lord, that today, just like Ryan said earlier, it's not any accident who's here this morning, who will be here in the next service, that you had us here today to receive something from you so we can take it out into the world and show off some Jesus. So, Lord, right now, I know all of us in this room have a lot of things calling our name. We, we are a busy people. And Lord, I just pray in Jesus' name, you bring our minds focused to your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see what your spirit wants to say to us today. Lord, we thank you. We do pray for our pastors right now. We hold up their arms. We pray that they would have a wonderful vacation. We pray refreshing over them, recharging into their hearts. 
Lord, we just pray you just, they don't matter, they don't matter a bunch of laughs, a lot, a lot of good laughter and joy and just rest, God. We pray rest over them. We thank you that they can get away and get with you and just have fun with each other. So now, Lord, Holy Spirit, help me speak once again. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Well, you heard it earlier. Just want to touch base on it real quick about this whole thing called Servolution. And uh, I'm, I have the honor today to kick off this series of Servolution. And as we're going to dive into it, and, and you're going to hear we're not so much talking about a place of serving here at the church, though I would encourage every single person to do that. Come on, we're, we're here to receive, but we're also here to give, all right? And God's called us to, to receive from Him and then give it away. And then when you're empty, you receive again, and then you give some more away. You keep, it's just a cycle of receiving from God and giving away. And so you should, we encourage you. And of course, our vision, if you're in this house and part of this house, you know what our vision is. It is love God, what it, come on, say it with me, love God, live people, change the world. Dang, y'all sound good this morning. Let's say it again. Love God, lift people, change the world. That's the vision of this house. And that's what we want to see happen over this, this month of June. It's already started over the weekend. Things going on Friday and Saturday, yesterday, and, and every weekend throughout this month. Uh, I'm excited. I'm going to be. I'm going to the Black Mountain Children's Home. and going to minister to some orphans and and love on some people. Find your place. Look at your schedule. See where you can plug in and serve somewhere so we can touch Western North Carolina with the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what God's called us to do. You know why? Why 25 days just to make sure we're on the same page? Well, it's a big deal because this is the Rock Church's 25th anniversary. 25 years. That, that's incredible. And what's even more incredible, come on, th- listen to this. What's even more credible about 25 years is they've had the same leaders for 25 years. The same pastors for 25 years. Just kind of give you a little contrast of that. Lisa and I served as youth pastors at an amazing church when we first started out in ministry 20 years ago uh, at New Covenant Church in Thomasville, Georgia. And I was there, Lisa and I were there for five years. Our daughter was born there. It was such a special church that even when we were in Texas, we took our boys when they were born in Texas back to Georgia to have them dedicated there. Just a special place in our heart. But when we were there for five years, we had two pastors. And that's, that's kind of the norm as pastors come and they go. We've had... A man and a woman that's been here for 25 years, and that's incredible. That's incredible. And so we're celebrating this 25th anniversary, and let me just go ahead and tell you, get ready because a party is coming this October. It's going to be awesome. But, you know, we started off the year with 25 days of prayer. That's the best way to start your year. 25 days of prayer and fasting, and then mid-March, we started 25 days of passion leading up to Easter. Come on, if you can't get excited about Easter, something's wrong, all right? And, and now we're in 25 days of serving. But here's where I want to get to this morning. Here's what we know. Serving is not defined as an event. Serving is not defined as a trip. Serving is not even defined as an allotted time like this month of servolution. Right here, serving is a lifestyle, and when we serve, come on, we look like Jesus. Serving is a lifestyle. It's a choice. It's not just a month called servolution. The servolution comes from the great revolution, Jesus Christ. And when you get a hold of who Jesus is and you realize all the greatness of him, it just comes out of you. You love him. You want to love your neighbors as yourself. You want to give yourself away. That, my brothers and sisters, is a true servolution. I'm not putting down the 30 days of this month. That's why we do what we do here. We want to love on our community. And mission trips, Romania team is leaving tomorrow, heading out across the world. We're, we're praying for them. You guys, we got your back in prayer. But that's not defining servanthood. Servanthood is a lifestyle, and when we serve, we look like Jesus. Come on, if you can create a culture of servanthood in your life, if I can create a culture of servanthood in my life, it will not only change my life, but it will change my marriage, it will change my family, it will change my place of employment, Come on, it will, it, will change, it will change your church. If you can create a culture, 
And, and by the way, did you know that you and I have the power to create? The great creator gave us the power to create a culture. That means if the whole world is going to hell, the hell doesn't have to come in your home because you've created a culture of heaven in your house. You have the authority by Jesus Christ to create culture. We have created by God's grace in this house over 25 years. And, of course, I'm standing on the shoulders of two other men. By the way, did you know all the youth pastors in this house have been named Chris? It's, it's, I don't know what. I'm like, they asked me on the phone, is your name Chris? Uh, yes. Okay, we'll talk to you. Uh, no, that, it, that didn't happen. It, it, just happened to, it just happened to be Chris because I think Chris is one of the greatest names in the world. So, uh, but, but anyway, so I'm standing on the shoulders of great men, and we're standing on the shoulders. You heard it from Pastor last week, great message. If you, did not, if you were not here last week, get the message. Oh, my goodness. It was amazing. And, but we're standing on the shoulders of people that have gone before us. And this house through the years has created a culture, a culture of worship, a culture of passion, a culture of serving, a culture of a call to the next generation. We've created that. And that means, though it may be different out there, it, doesn't, it can be completely different in here. And we take what's in here, come on, out there. We don't hold, we're not hoarders, all right? We give it away. Creating a culture of servant, servanthood will change your life. You know, it's interesting, uh, just thinking about this me- message and studying this week, I couldn't help but reflect of something that happened in our lives several years back. I had the honor, before Lisa and I moved here and our kids moved here, two years ago, this month actually, uh, and time has just flown by, uh, I had the honor and privilege to be a headmaster at a private Christian school, and it was a lot of fun. But before the board members came to me and approached me for the job, and this is many years back, um, I was subbing at the school. I was just a substitute teacher, uh, trying to provide for the family. And, uh, and so, yes, and, uh, and, and so literally, uh, they, I, I could see real quickly just coming in, they just call, just like if you've ever been a substitute before, they just call you, hey, you're on today, someone's sick or someone's out. So I just come in, and over time visiting, I could tell very quickly in this school that morale was really low. Uh, every, the facilities were a mess. Everything just, you could just put your hand across a desk or just walk. It was dirty. It was dusty. Uh, the students' attitudes were really low. E- everything was just low. Somebody say low. And uh, come on, we've all been there at times. It's easy to uh, allow that low to get in you. And, uh, and I was saddened by this because I went to this school as an elementary student, and it was the greatest Christian school in the, in the, the Wiregrass area, the region there where I was from, the Dothan, Alabama region. And it had lost its greatness for reasons unknown. It had lost its greatness, and it had become a mess. And so when one of the board members, the president, took me out to lunch and said, hey, we want you to take this job. We see, we see you have a heart for the school. You went here. You're an alumni. And I, I was like, oh, Jesus. You know, because I just, I just saw the mess. Come on, sometimes parents, we got students, and you walk in, you don't even walk into your kid's bedroom. You're just like, oh, Jesus. And, you know, there's probably something growing underneath the bed, you know. You just don't even go in there like, and, and, and students just talking about serving day, maybe you just need to clean your room, you know. It may, may, may the Spirit of the Lord come upon you all of a sudden this afternoon. You're just like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm, I'm organizing. I'm cleaning, you know. God can do anything. Come on. Parents, it may take great intercession, but go there. You know, so it's worth it. But, but, but here's, you know, the culture at the school was really low. And so I took the job. God said, yes, we took the job. And uh, the, my first day at work, I put on the calendar, three months later, we kind of scheduled out a big serve day, much like The Rock has here, a couple times a year. And I was hoping and praying, fingers crossed, knocking on wood, whatever I could do, Lord, let someone come. At least, Father, please let the staff come. Well, March comes there, and to my surprise, not only did the staff come, not only did every teacher come, parents came out of the woods, all the students came. It was amazing. It was a beautiful day. There was a wonderful spirit on the campus, a very large campus. Before, there was complaining, and everybody was just talking about each other and all this kind of stuff. And, and that day, many of the teachers, and my wife and I included, look at that day as a new beginning because we created a culture of serving each other. Other. And we started beautifying, if you'll allow me to use that word, the campus there. And guess what? Students' attitudes started changing. Teachers' attitudes started changing. 
Everything started changing. And now the school, when we left it, we left it in great hands, and it's going higher and higher and higher. God doesn't want us to live a good life. He wants us to live a great life, and the only way you can do that is by walking in servanthood. Thank you, God. Look at this real quick. This is a quote from J. Oswald Sanders, one of my favorite authors. This is huge right here. (laughs) If the heart of a servant is absent from your life, the best way to change is to start serving. Begin serving with your body, and your heart will catch up. (laughs) Begin serving with your body, and your heart will catch up. Sometimes you just got to make yourself do it, and your heart's like, oh, that's where we're going. You know? And so, for example, I told the teachers, going back to that school for a moment, I told the teachers, because we only had one custodian, a custodian on a huge campus, because the school was dying and they couldn't afford another custodian, and he was running around with his hair, I mean, literally his head about to fall off because he was so frustrated. I said, teachers, you're going to have to help our, our custodian out. You're going to have to clean your own room. And they were just like, you would have thought I told them that they lost their summer break or something. They were like, oh, clean our, what is he talking about? You know, and I said, look, we got to help a brother out. He is doing everything he can, and, and we're, we're, we, we've got to, we've got, and guess what? Teachers, I mean, they were doing it. Some of them were like, you know, just like under their breath. I can't believe I'm doing this. And, and I recognize them and me, we were only getting paid pennies. But guess what? When you do it unto God, his, your attitude changes and he blesses. He blesses. So sometimes you got to do it with your body and let your heart catch up. This whole thing about greatness, greatness. Jesus said in Mark 10, 43, we're going to read just a passage there, but this is from the Message Bible. Mark 10, 43, look at this. Whoever wants to be great must become what? A servant. Whoever wants to become great must become a servant. See, I don't believe there's anything wrong with any one of us in this room to want to have a great life. Doggone it. I want to have a great life. I want to have a great marriage. I want to have a great family. I don't think there's anything selfish with that desire. And I can, can I tell you what? It's also the desire of our Heavenly Father for us to have a great life, for us to have a great marriage. Come on, fellas. Let's don't settle for a good marriage. God wants us to have a great marriage. We don't need to settle for a, just a good family barely getting by. God wants us to have a great family. He really does. And I know we fight against so many things, and we even fight with each other. You know, I remember the first two years of our marriage, it was not heaven. I won't say what the other word, what it was, but it, it was definitely not heaven. And we were constantly, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff at each other. And that was all Lisa. All of it was her. I mean, it, I, I just prayed the whole time, you know, I... And come on, if you'll be real, it happens a lot on Sunday morning on your way to church. And then you walk in the door. Well, God bless you. God bless you, brother. You're looking good. I feel like crap, but you're looking good. We've all been there. (laughs) That's why you're laughing so loud. See, we've got to recognize and understand God wants us to have a great life, but we've got to adapt serving as a core value in our heart. Here's what the world, have you noticed when you read your Bible, students, when you read your Bible, have you noticed when you look at Jesus and you look at the world, they are in complete contrast. There is no comparison. Literally, it's like we, you know, if you're going to be a servant in this world, it's almost in a world that's full of me first. Come on. Me first. Me first. Me, 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 me. You know, it, it, we live in that world. Uh, it, it's not a popular concept in the world. It's very popular with Jesus. But it's not popular in the world we live in because it's all about me. Well, can I tell you what? It's not all about me. It's all about him. I am crucified with Christ. I no longer live. He lives in me and through me. And I walk this life out to bring glory to him. But here's the, deal, here's the deal. The world defines greatness in terms of, listen to these words, power, prestige, possessions, and position. That's what the world defines greatness as. Jesus never defined it that way. 
Pastor Rick Warren says this, Jesus measures greatness by service, not status. Jesus measures, measures greatness by serving, by service, not status. See, we've got to realize and understand, I know many of us know this, but I think it needs to be said, everything in the kingdom of God is upside down when it comes to the world. Let me, let me explain. Everything in the, in the kingdom of God is upside down when it comes to the world. Jesus, when he came on the scene, he did and said everything that was counterculture. We're going to look at that just a second in the scriptures. Let me give you a few examples, things that we've heard through the years. The world says this, you rise to greatness. Jesus says this, you descend to greatness. The world says you rise to greatness. It doesn't matter what you got to take, you get there and you rise to greatness. Jesus says you take the heart of a servant and you walk the road of humility. And the Bible says he will lift you up, he will exalt you. But if you're exalting yourself, you will be demoted. But if you live for the Lord, he will continually to promote. The Bible says promotion comes from the Lord, not from man. If you got promoted at your job, praise God, that's awesome. Pray that for every person in this room. But man did not promote you. The Lord did because of your faithfulness, because of your hardworking attitude, because of your hardworking ethic. Promotion comes from the Lord. Here's another one from the world. And this, there's a, some, a little bit of a truth in this one, actually. The world says, no pain, no gain. No pain, no gain. Jesus says this, my pain, others gain. Complete contrast. Two different thoughts completely. The first one is really all about us. The second one is always about others. This is huge. See, Jesus came along and he flipped everything on his head. I want to read just a very small paragraph from an article uh, that, forgive me, I don't have the author's name at this moment. I just somehow I didn't put it on my paper. But the question was this, what made Jesus so great? Please allow me to read this to you just for a second. He never made a lot of money, speaking of Jesus. In fact, he was poor, often without a place to lay his head. He never held political office or a position of power. He never pastored a mega church. He never graduated with honors from the most acclaimed university. He didn't command a great army in the likes of Alexander the Great or Napoleon. He certainly didn't die an honorable death in the eyes of the world, being nailed to a Roman cross as a common criminal. And then it says this, he didn't even have a decent funeral. So what is it that makes our Jesus so great? Well, you will find the answer right here in Mark chapter 10. We're going to start at verse 35. I might need a little water. I don't know. Uh, Mark chapter 10. Thank you, Ryan. Mark chapter 10. What makes Jesus so great? Well, besides being the Son of God and besides being the great and holy one, let's look at the answer right here. If we could just separate that, you know, for a second. Well, he's, he's the Son of God, Pastor Chris. That what makes Yes, yes, he is the Son of God and he is the great one. But let's look at some practical here, what he says. And, and I want you to see the audaciousness of these two boys right here, uh, of James and John. Many of you know this story. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, who's him, Jesus, Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. That's like, you know, the child coming to the parent, I need money and I need it now. I've already gone to mom and she said no. You notice they tell you that afterward. They never tell you that in the, in the beginning. Uh, then James and John, sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What, this is what Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you, ask? They replied, verse 37, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. He's like, what you talking about, Willis? You don't know what you are asking. You are out of your brain. What, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? And they just throw it off the hip. Oh, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink of the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. The baptism Jesus was talking about right there was not water, water baptism. It was the baptism of suffering. And we know later on that James was one of the first ones that was killed. He, had his, he was beheaded. 
as a martyr. And we know that John, who wrote a lot of the New Testament, John was, uh, he died a very lonely man on the island of Patmos. He was isolated. But of course, he was there with Jesus because he wrote the book of Revelation. <laughs> but both of them went through major suffering. And so Jesus was saying, yeah, you're going to drink from this cup. You're going to be baptized with the baptism of suffering. But then he said, but I can't tell you where you're going to sit. That's not my place. And look right here, verse 41. Just like any of us in the room, if we overheard this conversation, when the ten heard about this, they became angry. They became indignant with, indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know, look what he says right here. You know that those who are regarded as rulers of Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials excuse authority over them. Not so with you. Look at this. Instead, whoever wants to become great, somebody say great. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave of all. And then he says this, Mark 10, 30, uh, the final verse, 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Huge. See, Jesus coming on the scene, I'll just say this, before Jesus came on the scene, servants and slaves were the lowest positions in Jewish culture at that time. Slaves were even lower. Everybody didn't own a slave, but a lot of people did. So if you were a servant or you were a slave, you were disrespected, you got no respect, low prestige, low honor, low respect. Jesus comes on the scene and flips it totally on his head. And he said, if you're going to be a servant, you're going to be great. And if you're going to be a slave, you're going to be first. Remember what Jesus said about first. He said, those who are last shall be first and the first shall be last. And so he was always going counterculture. And so he used this example of servants and slaves to say this. Serving equals greatness. Serving equals greatness. Pastor Kirk has said this many times in two years that my family's been here. It's echoed in my spirit. It's become a part of who I am. He says this, your greatest life is found in serving others. Your greatest life, there's that word, your greatest life is found. Not just a good life, your greatest life is found in serving others. The great missionary Albert Schweitzer said this, I don't know what your destiny will be, but one thing I know. The ones among you who will be really happy, somebody say happy. The ones who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. Huge. And see, here's the thing about our Jesus. He wasn't a big smack talker. He, he actually walked it out. Come on, I took a picture of a ping pong table in my garage and put it on Facebook Good Lord, the smack talking that just started right there just from that picture. And, I, you know, I made one little line like, come to my house and get beat down or something like that, you know. And <laughs> something, something you'll, you'll walk away with your head down, you know, and, but yet yearning for more, you know. And so, um, and Ryan can tell you, I've beat him so many times. He's such a humble man. But uh, <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, yeah, I have the microphone, Ryan. Uh, but, <laughs> but. <laughs> But here's the deal. I love my brother. I love my brother. Jesus wasn't a smack talker. He walked it out. And he demonstrated the greatest thing that you and I know of, of, of giving up everything was his life. But I want to go backwards to close this out. I want to go backwards to the last few hours. Again, in your Bible, turn very quickly as we close out to John chapter 13, five verses. The first five verses. Many of you may even know where I'm going with this. Please listen these last few minutes because I believe the Holy Spirit would speak something new to you as he spoke to me over this week studying this. John 13, starting at verse 1, reading out of the New Living Translation. Before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. And now he loved him to the very end. It was time for supper. And the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Now let me just pause for a second. 
Uh, if you read the whole chapter, you realize that Judas is still in the room. His heart has been prompted. He has not walked out of the room yet where Jesus took the, you know, he dipped the bread and said, you know, who it is that uh, will betray me will also dip right after me. You know, so Judas is in the room, but his heart has already been tempted. His heart has already been prompted. I've got to find a way to betray Jesus. So look right here. Look what happens. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. That speaks to us that we got to know who we are. you got to know who you are. Can I tell you what? When you know who you are, it doesn't matter if you're cleaning a toilet or if you're out someplace or you're greeting or whatever it is. When you know who you are, you're not worried about what people say about you. You're doing it for the glory of God. You're serving him because you want to bring a smile to his face. You're serving your wife by actually taking the dishes out of the dishwasher and drying them and putting them up. And we'll go all practical. I mean, come on. Let's just for a second stop for a second. Chick-fil-A, they know something about service. Other businesses, they know some. I know that especially, you know, 42 years old, I've seen customer service go to nothing in this world. But there are some companies out there that know what they're doing. Some are Christian, some are not. Here's the deal. Serving is a principle that will affect your life, Christian or not. It will change your life, it will rock your world, and it will bring greatness into you. And it will bring greatness into your business. I love ordering from Chick-fil-A. I think Chick-fil-A is going to be in heaven. Number four, spicy chicken, pepper jack on there, a large sweet tea, and yes, upsize those fries. They're going to greet me. At, Peter's going to at the gate. Here you go, Pastor Chris. We know you talked about it your entire life, you know. And can I tell you, but, but I also love, what, have you noticed what they say to you when they give you the stuff? Thank you so much. Our pleasure. Anything I can do for you. Someone learn the art of serving. And they're teaching a whole young generation that maybe could care or care less. they got to do it if they want to keep the job. The art of serving. So Jesus is right here. It all started with Jesus. It didn't start with Chick-fil-A and Mr. Truett. It started with Jesus. And Jesus knew that the, verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and would return to God. Verse 4, so he got up from the table, look at this, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin, and then he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. Can I just say that in Hebrew culture, I guarantee you this room was silent, and all you could hear was the trickling of water because they had never seen this before. The master serving the disciple. Slaves only washed feet. And if if you didn't have a slave, it was the wife. And if the wife didn't do it, it was the children. But it was never the master of the home. But here it is. God in flesh. The King of kings and Lord of lords. Stay with me in this last couple minutes. Get this picture. What made Jesus so great? Because he could have in these last hours, he knew it was this last, he could have put his feet up and said, I want every one of you to come wash these suckers. (laughs) And we know that they weren't wearing Nike shoes. We know that. It was nasty. It was dirty. It was a mess. It was the first thing. You'd get some oil on your head when you walked in culture then. You'd wash your hands and you'd have your feet washed, usually by the slave. Jesus, God in flesh, sent to earth to save mankind, takes off his outer robe, gets a towel and wraps it around his waist, pours water into a basin and goes to everyone, including the betrayer. Now, I don't know about you, but if it had been me at the betrayer, I'd have jack slapped that guy. This is my last hour. I'm going to let it out right now because I know what you're about to do to me. I'm telling you, in the flesh, we would do those things. Jesus showed the prime example of even the people that hate you and hurt you and despise you. The Bible says he was despised. He was spit upon. He was hit. He was unrecognizable. His mother Mary, like, is that my son? On the cross. He took it all for you and I. He took it for us, and he gave us the greatest example of what it means to serve mankind. John 15, 13 says this, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. I pray this morning, as we pray now, that the great revolutionary Jesus Christ would create in us 
and we would allow him in me a true servolution, not one for 30 days, but for the rest of our life. Let's pray. Right now in this moment, just give us all just an opportunity to check ourselves, check our hearts. Thank you, Lord. You are welcome here in this moment. Maybe you're here this morning and if you just be really honest with yourself, this is not for me, this is for you. If you'll be really honest with yourself, just like I have to be every morning, that I pray that prayer, search me, oh God. See if there be anything in me that's not of you. Maybe you're here this morning and if you'll be really honest with yourself, your heart feels very cold. You feel very distant from the Lord. You, you, you feel like you're walking a million miles away from him instead of running after him. And can I tell you, we can't run from him. He'll, he'll chase us down. He loves us that much. That much. And we're never alone. Even when we go in rebellion, we're never alone. He's right there yearning for us to be back in fellowship with him. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you feel that way. Or maybe you're here this morning and you know about Jesus, but you've never asked him into your heart. You've never said, Jesus, come into my life. Oh, great one, come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. So right now in this moment, with every head bowed and every eye closed, to give you that opportunity, just with a signal of a hand, to say, hey, pray for me, Pastor. Uh, my heart is cold. I feel distant from God. Or maybe, like I said, you're here and you've never really asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. On the count of three, just ask you all across this room, just be honest with yourself. God knows your heart right where you're at. You feel cold, you feel away, you feel distant, or you, you just feel like, you know, I... I'd never really asked him to be my Lord and Savior. One, two, three, hands up if, if that's you in Jesus' name. Yeah, God sees hearts. He sees hands, he sees hearts. Thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. You just feel cold, you feel distant. He's not distant from you, it's us that walk away. It takes the first step, that's why I say be honest with yourself. He says in James, draw close to God. You take the first step and he'll draw close to you. Anybody else, just give you this opportunity. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. Come on, let's stand together right where we're at. I don't have some scheduled prayer. Just pray with me this morning. Put your hand on your heart. That's what Christ died for. Just pray after me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, my heart is yours. And I place it into your hands. I surrender my life to you. I want your ways and your will. Help me, God. Be all that you call me to be. And help me show off Jesus to every single soul. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can we give God glory? Thank you, Lord. Amen.